Thank you. Um, that was a simply fantastic talk about sly molds. Um, I also am an academic biologist, uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, connections of that to, to roguelikes, um, but somewhat more abstractly. So I, I am, um, before I was a, a, a scientist, I was a game developer at one point, uh, developed a, a couple of games. Uh, one of them, my first one was called Pipeline uh, in the 80s, and it's a four-way scrolling uh, RPG with puzzles and so on. Uh, and so it's, it's tile-based. I wish I'd known a little bit more about cellular automata and some of the ideas I'm going to talk about. Uh, and in, in a lot of ways, you know, I'm just tr trying to come back to that game and do it better, I think. I also did a very sort of anemic first-person shooter that you can see up there before moving into uh, science. And, and so I, you know, I worked as a physicist, uh, sort of simulations of various physical systems. Very, simulations of various, thank you, uh, thank you. No, simulations of si uh, things like polymer dynamics. Um, and, you know, mostly nowadays I work in molecular evolution and I'm interested in, in biopolymers and DNA and RNA and, and in the origin of life, reconstructing ancient viruses and all sorts of cool things like that. And in fact, you know, some of my, the most influential games have, uh, have touched on this theme of artificial life, they life. Um, it, influential to me. So really the one that, that I hold up as the most influential game is probably one that very few people have heard of, if any. It's a game called Exile. It's in uh, what's known as the, the Metroidvania genre. It's an absolutely phenomenal game, and I can't do justice to it in the time I have here, but I would encourage you to check it out. There's a whole sort of cult movement about it. Um, and I think relevantly for this conference, it used procedural generation in a very interesting way to circumvent the 32K memory limit on the machines at the time. So they basically actually used procedural procedural content very heavily curate, curated to generate a giant map. And that in combination with sort of Newtonian physics uh, and a very, very rich ecosystem with lots of interactions between the different agents, the different kinds of animals and creatures and so, so forth in this game, uh, and then all the physical properties like mass and viscosity and, and wind and so on. It's an absolutely phenomenal game, uh, and, and I really encourage you, you can actually play it now in a web browser uh, on an emulator. Um, and so that's sort of the, you know, the ecosystem, and that influenced me a lot. I really would like to build something like that at some point. And sort of a, and then a completely different kind of game, uh, or, or I, I guess it's a game, uh, is the programming game. Core War. How many people have heard of Core War? Yeah, right. Fantastic game. Uh, very much aimed at programmers, though, right? It's sort of not, not really a very accessible game. Uh, and it's, if anywhere, it's sort of gone off into the, the academic community, I would say, the, the offshoots of Core War and th include things like various A-Life uh, simulations which try to evolve the programs in various different ways, uh, uh, like um, uh, Titus Brand's Vida and Tierra and so on. So, you know, one of, uh, on, on this note, one system that's always really fascinated me, and it's come up a few times uh, in the course of this conference, uh, are cellular automata. So, you know, the basic idea of cellular automata, of course, is you have something like a lattice, a, t it's a system of tiles, and you have a simple set of rules for how the tiles interact with their neighborhood. Uh, and these, you know, I'm, I'm using cellular automata in a very, very broad sense here to include not just the sort of synchronous type of cellular automata that John Conway developed, uh, where you, you know, you do a little uh, arithmetic op operation on your neighborhood, count the number of cells of a particular type, and then switch based on that, but also sort of more general lookup table driven things that count as reaction diffusion systems or just general simulations. You can kind of, I think of them as sort of simulations of computational chemistry, but in fact, they can be all kinds of things, uh, you know, where you're basically just looking at sort of uh, random interactions between different types of cell. Uh, and, and of course you can get sort of more elaborate and rarefied with how these interactions are organized. You can do things like the uh, uh, entity component uh, kind of system sort of model that we've heard about earlier today. You can have them be more object oriented and respond to various messages and so on. But the basic idea is that you're talking about very localized interactions between a cell and its neighborhood that may or may not happen synchronously, may or may not happen at the same speed. You can have faster or slower cells doing various different things. And there's a very large variety of models in science that build on just this framework, right? Uh, from the earliest stuff that Alan Turing did, describing why leopards get their spots in terms of various interacting chemical morphogens that you can think of as a reaction diffusion system, uh, to things like models of fire, models of diffusion limited aggregation for crystal growth. Uh, lots of games have particulate fluids in them now. Uh, models of forest fires, I've got Conway's Life up there. You know, uh, digging into the Conway's Life literature, you can find some, some wonderful examples of uh, uh, life being used to simulate other cellular automata or simulate life itself within life or simulate a Turing machine or uh, recently someone uh, simulated Tetris, I believe, in life. Uh, sorry, yeah, I think it was Tetris. So, 
Um, you know, there is, in fact, a, a, a large, a similarly large range of cellular automata that have been used in games. Uh, and, uh, you know, a few of them I've put up here. This is sort of an ever-growing set, actually. It's very difficult to keep current. Uh, but I think that some deserve certain mentions. Um, SimCity, I think, is, is really useful because it's been very well studied. And if you read Haim Gingold's PhD thesis, which he did with Michael Mateus at UCSC, he talks a lot about the various different layers of cellular automata in SimCity and how they interact. <clears throat> And then, of course, you know, there are pure toys. There are things like Golly, which is a game of life simulator. Uh, there's Kapow, which Rudy Rucker down San Jose State developed as a continuous valued cellular automata. Uh, there are lots of little mini games, like the ones by Grant Robinson I put up there. And then sort of bigger things like Dwarf Fortress and Minecraft, which you know, more or less fit into the kind of framework that I'm talking about. They're, they're tile-based and there's interactions uh, between cells, although there's a lot more, of course, going on in those games as well. And, you know, I've got this one slide talking about CAs in roguelikes. Unfortunately it, was a, unfortunately, it was a little late for me to adapt these slides and include the many excellent examples that we've heard about. You know, I, I was really interested to hear about Caves of Curd having a, a, a melting point for every wall, for example. You know, and, and there's been a lot of very cool things that have been said about uh, cellular automata and agent-based systems. Perhaps the classic example, though, is using a cellular automata to create a realistic-looking cavern. And there's this example up on Rogue Basin uh, of how to do this. And so I've been using this in some of my games. So I will switch now to talk about some of the things that I've done. But um, really, I'm, I kind of want to talk about the principles that have come out of that that I think might be useful. Um, and before I talk about my games, I should mention uh, there's been some really good advice offered uh, throughout this conference about the importance of rapidly producing stuff and getting stuff out the door. Darius talks about you know, how his stuff is, is, is brilliantly stupid. I'm adding the brilliantly. He said stupid is very self-deprecating. But his stuff is very quick, you know, and he makes a virtue of that and sort of bringing it out. And we've had lots of other people talk about you know, the importance of finishing stuff. I agree with all of this, but it's a case of do as I say, not as I do. I rarely finish things these days, but I'm much more interested in developing prototypes. Uh, and so these are a few of the prototypes that, that I have developed. Uh, that really haven't really seen the light of day except sort of at talks like this, but I'll talk a little bit about what I was trying to do with them. Uh, the one up in the top left of the screen is one of my first ones, and that's a, it's just a sort of predator-prey system with a rock-paper-scissors ecology, but it's, you can see it's kind of psychedelic, uh, and that the game there, such as it was, was about sort of trying to balance the different populations, and then if you get into it, you can kind of introduce different colors, create enclosures to sort of present them, prevent them from killing each other, and you basically, the idea very loosely was you're a zoo zookeeper, and you're trying to manage a zoo. And then in the, the version that's to the bottom left, I elaborated on this a little bit, slowed things down a bit, and started adding in more kinds of particles and agents, permeable membranes, fluids, particulate fluids, and uh, uh, various cells and enclosures, and uh, uh, things with little programs, and various things that would interact with each other. Uh, and then the one on the bottom right is basically the same kind of thing, but I rebuilt it all in a C virtual machine to make it fast. And, and uh, you know, the, one of the themes that I was trying to go with here was sort of the emergent feel of kind of looking at a, a very fast evolving system, like you might do if you, know, if you look at a, a simulation of, of a gas that's done in computational physics or something like that, or a fluid. You kind of see things moving around very, very fast in this sort of Brownian motion style, style way, not really going anywhere, and yet sort of overall patterns can develop, and that can kind of be what you build the gameplay around. So I'll talk a little bit more about my latest version, Nematode, my latest game in this vein, uh, in a second. But first, you know, being a professor, I kind of can't resist putting together a curriculum when I do a talk like this, so I apologize for that. Um, I think that the really the key concepts that come out for me are really just models of gases, to some extent polymers as well, and populations. But really, gases and populations are kind of these two concepts. There's a whole bunch of theory around simulating those on lattices that can really help. And uh, as one of the ways I think that it can help, I would like to point to the problem of balancing. Right? When you start having lots and lots of things that interact with each other, especially things that can spawn and grow and create new things or, or trigger catastrophic events like fires and so on, you have to think a lot about how you're balancing your system. And there are a lot of tools for doing this in the stochastic process modeling literature and in, in stochastic 
stochastic physics and chemistry and biology, particularly the idea of detailed balance uh, in a Markov chain, uh, these various simulation systems like Metropolis Hastings algorithm, and then there's a whole bunch of models for diffusion processes in physics, uh, starting with random walks and then going up to things like uh, 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 polymers and little cells and, uh, uh, and, and the ways that uh, bacteria sort of do random walks and things like that. Um, so, and then finally, sort of the birth-death process is really a very key uh, one to study if you're going to try and think about how to avoid spawning problems from taking over your whole map. Um, but there's sort of a whole bunch of stuff here that I've found somewhat useful and I keep coming back to in these prototypes. And hopefully soon I'll finish one of these prototypes. So this is a, an example of uh, one, that, well, this is my latest one. Uh, it's a game called Nematode. Uh, you can see a very crude early demo at nematode.de. Uh, it's not at all really playable yet, but I mean, this is, this is the demo being played, but there's no sort of goal or, or, or much of a shell around it. But as you can see, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of messing with the mechanic a little bit. It's taking a snake-like mechanic and putting it sort of in a roguelike kind of setting here with just some very, very crude uh, kind of graphics. I mean, in fact, I made a, a point of trying to be minimalistic about the graphics at this point and not include any sprites, really, although there's a, a couple of things. Um, what it does have is... Uh, generative text, so it has the, uh, some, some of the objects in the world have these sort of procedural text uh, descriptions. Um, the whole world itself is procedurally generated, it's persistent, it's multiplayer in theory, all the, the demo up there isn't multiplayer, but there is a multiplayer server and you can kind of all join in, in the same world. And it's basically, the whole thing is implemented within a cellular automata with a few extensions, so it's got gases, it's got sort of polymers, uh, it's got things that move in directions, various different ways, it's got rigid bodies like that door that I just opened by pulling out of the way. Um, and uh, yeah, the multiplayer sort of works using Alan Kay's tea time model, which was developed from his uh, open croquet work. Uh, and, and the whole thing is running in JavaScript um, with Node on the back end. So uh, please, please do take a look at that and grab me, and, and I'd love to, to talk about that game and, and where it's going. Um, but essentially, the, the basic idea is it's sort of knitting together some of these cellular automata things that I'm talking about with, with uh, uh, roguelikes. So I just want to switch tack for the last couple slides that I have here and talk about some of the technologies in here. And um, so, so there are three grammars in Nematode that three types of grammar that I use extensively. Um, and, and we've heard a lot about, uh, you know, implicitly or explicitly, about string-based grammars for generating procedural text, basically sort of templates that kind of expand recursively. Uh, I've talked a bit about cellular automata and some of the principles of, of how I go about designing those, you know, based on stochastic biology and physics. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, the so-called graph grammar, uh, and this is a way of generating graph structures, and this is what I use at the minute to generate the level design for Nematode, and I think it, it could be useful in a number of other concepts, and so, in fact, I've released the code that I do, that I use to do this as an open source project, or rather, I am releasing it now. This is sort of, this is the release. It's released, so I will tell you now what it does. Um, and, but before I do that, I need to give a very, uh, uh, a, a strong nod to Joris Dormans, um, who basically pioneered using this kind of graphic uh, grammar for his roguelike Unexplored. He has a really nice talk on it on YouTube. Uh, I would encourage you to go to that. I'm not trying to steal his thunder in any way, but I have got an open source library that does some of this stuff. So I guess piggybacking on what he's done in, in a sense. And, and really, Unexplored, uh, you know, and, and, and I wouldn't call myself like the top connoisseur of roguelikes, but I can get, very much get the sense that one of the strengths of Unexplored uh, is that it has levels that seem to have a lot more cohesiveness uh, and, and sort of uh, have this feel of being human designed, in the sense um, uh, that, that, uh, that Ben was talking about. And so one of the ways that they achieve that is used by this use of graph grammars, which I'll now try and summarize very quickly. The idea of a graph grammar uh, is, at least in the case of, of these levels for uh, unexplored and for nematode, is that you start basically with a lattice, so representing your map. So this is sort of a bit zoomed out from the individual tiles. This is just the overall organization. And then what you do is, you know, much, much like with a string grammar where you apply a set of transformation rules to, to transform your string, in a graph grammar you apply a set of transformation rules to transform this graph. And the way that you transform it is by sort of extending paths or introducing detours or introducing lock key puzzles or shortcuts and so on. But you do so in a way that kind of connects the things. So that, for example, you can set up, it's very easy to set up a, 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 a scheme where you... Uh, uh, you know, you have sort of a path that goes off through some side quest in order to get a key. 
which unlocks a door, okay, that's sort of pretty standard in this sort of system, but then to set it up in such a way that there's always a shortcut back from where the key is to where the door is. Uh, and so you end up with these sorts of so-called cyclic levels that basically have an overall structure, sort of long-range structure, as well as just the kind of short-range local structure that you get from a string grammar or something like that. This is zoomed in, this is what that level looks like. And so, you know, there's sort of a, a, an overall structure to it. I did put in a red herring uh, at one end, but otherwise there's sort of an overall structure which sort of brings you back to the start uh, and, and allows you to skip things and so on. Uh, and this is just one kind of graph that you can generate using graph grammars. The basic idea is just that you have a recipe of transformations that you can apply to a graph, starting from one point and ending up with the kind of graph that you want to get. So, for example, um, this actually wasn't the first graph uh, that, that I generated, the first kind of grammar that I built using this system. One that I did earlier was in the context of an automatically generated choose-your-own-adventure story. Uh, this is a graph that was generated by that grammar, uh, and again, you can kind of zoom in and see individual bits. And basically, this looks a bit more like a sort of a, a tree-like structure, but it still has these sort of local cycles that were generated as part of the graph grammar. And so this is sort of a, an ending where you see a boss, and here is an ending where you die. Uh, and so all of these sections are basically driven by, this is the source for generating this. They're driven by a very, very small, compact set of rules. And that really is, I think, the appeal of, of a lot of these sorts of systems is that you can drive your program you know, with a very small set of rules that are conceptually easy to understand and to analyze uh, and to debug and maintain. Um, so, OK, so that's my talk. Um, I haven't talked at all about one of my other projects, such a short slot, uh, but I think it is relevant, so I'll mention it very briefly. Wikimess.me is a uh, wiki messenger. It's not released yet, but I would like to get uh, discussions kicked off. It's basically a procedural messenger where the, the, the messages are sort of generated from a, an underlying grammar. Uh, and so it's kind of fun. Then there's nematodes. So you can check both of those out. There's demos online, and, and some of this is open source code, in particular the graph grammar uh, library, which I'd encourage you all to, to pick up and look at. OK, thanks very much. Uh, OK, we have time for a few questions. Any questions? Hmm? Hmm? Some no? Yes? Okay. It's hard. I can't see everyone from the stage, so. Uh, I really love the Joris Dorman's talk that you mentioned. I've, uh, I watched it and I think it's, uh, he describes some really fantastic ideas. Uh, one thing that I've been thinking about recently is um, building maps that look less organic and more um, kind of designed or uh, architectural. Uh, and one really common feature of that is symmetry. So have you uh, come across anything in uh, graph grammars about generating symmetrical or otherwise like intelligent looking levels? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think it's absolutely symmetry is one of the things we look for, um, but it, it's hard to generate with these sort of uh, rule-based systems that, that apply, that work locally, because it's a global property. Um, I think that there is a productive interaction between these sorts of approaches and the sort of MCMC-based approaches that we, we heard about earlier from uh, from Ben and Kate Cud uses something like that as well, so it's sort of sequential Hamilton Monte Carlo. You know, I think that there was a really nice paper a few years ago that sort of kicked this off, this idea of procedural alibi generation, that if you encounter an NPC in a game, there's sort of this algorithm that can just on demand give you its backstory, and it's a backstory that fits with everything else that you've seen in the game, right? And it does this by sort of rapidly just using MCMC to stochastically explore the space of backstories until gradually the fit improves and improves and it gets one that's better. I think this is something that you can apply throughout games, right? I mean, you can imagine that uh, a persistent MMO could have sort of areas where everyone starts off independently and they all sort of start to knit together and you could have a system like this kind of combining everything, backstories, histories, you know, uh, lore. So, yeah, um, I think that, anyway, I think that those, that's the way to achieve these sorts of global cost functions um, and, and kind of integrate them with these probabilistic grammars and things like that. Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <laughs>